Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Slicker, I have a few questions for you in the context of IGNAT 2022. So as the initiator of the International Conference on Neuroprotective Agents, would you be so kind as to share your first-hand opinion on this event? Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, you know, uh, this being the, the 15th conference, uh, we do have some experience in this area, uh, but we've been very excited about the opportunities here. Uh, your, your team has taken very good care of us and we have an excellent arrangement of speakers and the uh, technical accommodations uh, and, and support has been wonderful. But you know, I think the most important thing is to bring people together and uh, as this conference has done since the very beginning, uh, when Bruce Trimley and I, uh, Bruce Trimley uh, passed away a few years ago, but he was trained as a neurosurgeon. Uh, I'm trained as a pharmacologist, toxicologist, and we decided uh, in 1991 that we needed to pull people together from various disciplines to really attack this problem of trying to protect the nervous system. And so to do that, uh, we not only enlisted individuals uh, in the neurosurgery and psychiatry area, but also um, fundamental science areas, uh, drug developers, regulators, uh, and, and you know, clinicians and clinicians in training. And so from the very beginning, it's been important for us to have the opportunity to have people with various backgrounds work together to try to solve some of these issues and, and provide neural protection. Uh, and also uh, to be able to train individuals uh, that could do it into the future. So I think that uh, the arrangements that have been made here for us uh, have just been outstanding and uh, certainly would uh, uh, you know, really appreciate everything you've done to, to make this uh, a really fantastic meeting. So thank you. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done it without your input. So. <laughs> So my next question would be, considering your background, how would you describe the impact of neuroprotection on neurotoxicity in the context of the research presented at IGNA 2022? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, what we're learning here, and we just uh, are at the end of a session on the influence of space travel on the nervous system, you can see that the diversity of that uh, compared to some of the other topics yesterday that dealt with more traditional uh, neural insults, either due to drug exposures, anesthesia, that sort of thing. So it really is a diverse uh, approach of understanding impacts in the nervous system. And I think that that uh, sort of integrated approach uh, is, is very positive. Uh, we're just learning new things today, uh, you know, about um, uh, intracranial pressure, uh, and that influence uh, on the function of the nervous system and how you can monitor that to make sure that uh, you have a normal pressure within the, within the brain. Uh, we're learning more about how to do uh, imaging of the brain and do quantitative assessments of the brain function as well as anatomy. So those things are all very useful. So the development of uh, really precise biomarkers is really key and we're seeing a lot of that work uh, today and also yesterday when we were looking at uh, a lot of animal model work trying to understand what biomarkers would be most effective in gauging uh, how to protect the nervous system in humans, which is your ultimate goal. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I have one last question for you regarding the pandemic, since it's an ongoing subject. Mm -hmm. So as the world enters the third year of COVID-19 pandemics, doctors face more and more complex neurological cases. Considering your experience on this, what are the most relevant issues to be addressed in the near future? Yeah, that's a really a very important question. And, um, you know, even though, as you said, we're entering the third year of uh, individuals experiencing COVID, 19, um, our understanding of the influence on the nervous system is still not where we need it to be. Um, we are learning certain things though, and unfortunately some of those have to do with what's sort of termed loosely as brain fog. And that brain fog has the idea that your nervous system does not function as well as it used to before exposure to COVID-19, before that infection. And it happens apparently in somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of individuals that have COVID-19 infection. Uh, it does tend to recover over time, but some people do not recover fully. So it's not anything that's trivial. Uh, we do not understand it very well at all at this point in time. So uh, we are really working very hard to do that. I would say from my perspective uh, as a uh, uh, you know, a, a, a human uh, who's interested in protecting the nervous system, 
that uh, we oftentimes turn to animal models to try to understand you know, what is at the, the foundation of this problem of brain fog following COVID uh, infection. And uh, you know, the, the animal models just have not been developed yet to, to really address this. Uh, so I think that's one area that really needs to be strengthened so that we can understand more fundamentally what's going on. There seems to be uh, certainly some perhaps immune function involved in this um, and also uh, the, the shape and size of the brain. Uh, many things seem to be going on. We don't understand them all. We really need more fundamental work in that area. One sort of bright spot, since we do have a lot of interest in developmental neurotoxicity, uh, is that a recent publication uh, by, by Dr. Sonia Rasmussen, uh, who was at the University of Florida, now at Johns Hopkins. Uh, before that, she was a longtime member of the Center for Disease Control, Control within the US, CDC. Uh, her uh, study, along with other investigators, uh, seemed to indicate that there probably was not a birth defect associated with COVID-19 infection in pregnant moms. And this is a very positive outcome because so many things, of course, as you know, can adversely infect development. But as far as her recent data, and it's, it's new, and it's also limited because there hasn't been that length of time, but the human data suggests that there probably isn't a syndrome of developmental toxicity associated with COVID exposure in pregnant moms as we know it right now. So that was very positive to learn. There'll be follow-up studies, I'm sure, on that. But I think that, uh, you know, all in all, that, that's really good news. So we have a long ways to go in understanding the influence of uh, COVID on the nervous system. And uh, we'll take a combination of efforts, uh, both uh, animal model studies and human studies, to really understand that and try to understand if there's any treatments that are possible. All right. Thank you so much for your interview and for your whole input for this conference. Well, thank you very much, and I really appreciate uh, the efforts of the entire team uh, working on this together. It's been a real delight, and I think it really has influenced uh, the positive outcome of the entire uh, operation. So thank you. Thank you so much.